We all know that the storms of life strike at the most unexpected times. I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world and staying in homes of people in different parts of the world, and you don't have to travel too much until you discover that every home has its heartache, every heart has its shadows. I have seven children, and I have three grandsons. And when my first grandson was born, we were very excited, of course, and it wasn't long until we discovered that he had been born deaf in both his ears. And then along came the second grandson, and it wasn't long until we saw there was something that concerned us there, and the doctors told us that he was severely autistic. And to this day, although he's eight years old, he's never said a word. And then along came the third grandson, and he was even more severely autistic than the previous one. But you know, lots of people have their stories. Lots of people have their problems. And the question really is, when the problems of life come, do they drive us away from God or closer to God? The question is often asked this way. If God is a God of love, why is there so much suffering in the world? And it seems that um, people come up with one of three options. Option number one, I don't think there is a God. How could there be a God with so much chaos and trouble in the world? A friend of mine visited the city of Cologne in uh, the days before the Second War. And there he saw the beautiful Cologne Cathedral, one of the most exquisite pieces of architecture that has ever been built by man. He was back again after the war, and you know the city of Cologne had the dubious honor of being the most bomb city in Europe because it was the railhead of the Ruhr Valley where the German Nazi war machine was being built. He wondered if Cologne Cathedral had survived but as he drew near, he saw great gaping holes in the roof of that structure and stained glass windows blown to smithereens. As he stood and looked at the structure, he said, Now, should I assume, because the building was in ruins, that therefore there was no builder? Oh, no, he said. In fact, there were things I could learn about the builders now that I couldn't learn before. I could look into the structure and see the great beams that held the building together that had been hidden before. And he said, you know, there are some things we can only learn about God in the tough times of life. God didn't build this world to be a place of suffering. The Bible makes it clear that when God made the world, he saw everything, that it was very good. But obviously something has happened. Something tragic has happened in the world. And the Bible tells us what it is. There has been a civil war in the universe. There was a superhuman spirit being. His name was Lucifer. He was to be a servant of God. But he decided to put self in the place of God and said, I'll be God. And God cast him down. And since that time, this one now known as Satan or the devil has led a long war against God. Sadly, the human race decided to side with him in his battle. And of course, When we think about how God made the world, some people ask, well, why didn't God make people so they couldn't sin, so they couldn't make bad choices? Well, 
it's a bit like a Russian election, isn't it? <laughs> you can vote, but there's only one party. Well, that's not really an election at all, is it? That's not a real choice if there aren't real options. If I say to my little boy, David, you tell me you love me. And he says, I love you, Dad. And I say, thank you, son. That warms my heart. It doesn't work that way, does it? Love has to be a real choice if it's going to be love at all. And we have laws against people who, when they love someone and the person doesn't love them back, they go and force their love on that person. Why, you wouldn't want that to happen to you, would you? And so love is a choice. And God gave the human race a choice. And the sad record of the human race is that we, we chose not to love God. We chose to cut ourselves loose from him. And you can see that. The Bible tells us that we're all rebels. And some people say, now, wait a minute, sir. You've come here from Michigan to, uh, to defame my character. You've come to tell me I'm a rebel. I don't think I'm a rebel. Well, let me give you a few tests. We see a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. What do you want to do? You just want to see if it's wet, don't you? Someone has said that what God should have told Adam and Eve was, don't eat the snake. <laughs> and we come by it naturally, you know. You put a child into a room full of toys, and you say, you can play with any toys you want, honey. Just don't touch the thing on the piano, all right? As far as they're concerned, there's only one thing in the room. They want to get the thing that they can't have. The best way to make a book a bestseller is ban it. And all of a sudden, everybody wants it. So when we think about this problem we have in our hearts, what's gone wrong with the world? The famous writer G.K. Chesterton on one occasion responded to an editorial in the London Times. The question was, what's wrong with the world? He sent in this short letter to the editor. Dear sir, I am respectfully G.K. Chesterton. We look into the mirror and we realize we don't even come up to our own standards, let alone God's. We don't even keep our own New Year's resolutions. We need to get fixed. And so we recognize that this this idea that there's no God at all is not a valid way to think about the universe. You're free to take that option. But the end of that option is hopeless despair. In fact, the Bible goes so far as to say that a person who says there's no God is a fool. And that's just a logical conclusion. Why would God call a person a fool who says there's no God? Well, in order to say there's no God, you would have to have been everywhere and know everything, right? Otherwise, God could be outside of your range of travel or your range of knowledge. Like Yuri Gagarin, the first Russian cosmonaut, went up a few miles into space, and he came back and said, well, there's no God. I didn't see him. There are a few other areas of the universe that he didn't visit. If he was really serious about meeting God, all he had to do was step outside the spacecraft. But to say there's no God is to say, I know everything, and I've been everywhere, and I know there's no God. Well, how do we define God? God is the one who knows everything and is everywhere. So in order to say there's no God, you'd have to be God, in which case it's a foolish thing to say, isn't it? Oh, no, God says, I've proved myself to you. My existence in the universe is so obvious that only a fool would conclude there was no God. Like the little girl in Russia, Yip Harburg talks about, who said one day, Mommy, does God know that we don't believe in him? The Bible says that the creation around us declares that there is a God. And not just a God, but the wisdom and power of God is shown in the universe. Do you know, in the summertime on the southern horizon, you can see a red star 
called Antares. Antares, if you could cut it in half and hollow it out, you could put the Sun and Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars inside that one star and they could all continue in their orbit without touching the outside edge. And that's not the biggest star. There are some supernovas so big they could swallow our whole solar system. And the Bible says God made them. They're the work of his hands. He, he made the stars also. That's all it says about the creation of the stars. In the Genesis record, he made the stars also. And from the mega world down to the most infinitesimal part of life, in your body is a DNA strand that is yours alone. No one else in the world. Six and a half billion souls today in the world. You're you and no one else is like you. Imagine this. I mean, everybody gets two ears, one nose, two eyes, two cheekbones, one set of lips, a chin, and now and again some hair. And yet with a slight rearrangement of those features, we have six and a half billion individuals. Every one of them personally designed by God. My friend, you are not a cosmic accident. You are the object of God's care and attention. There are other people who say, well, okay, I believe there's a God, but he must be an all-powerful God who doesn't care about us. He's a kind of absentee landlord. And he made the world, okay, but then he's just abandoned us. And here we are floating off in space, and God doesn't care. Well, you might have drawn that conclusion if it wasn't for a very special event that occurred in the world about 2,000 years ago. When God sent his own son to this planet. And he sent his son to this planet not to condemn us, not to judge us, but to save us. At the time of the terrible tsunami that hit the India coast and Southeast Asia, Franklin Graham was interviewed on Hannity and Combs. And Mr. Combs, a well-known liberal, said to Franklin Graham, how can you say there's a God of love when these little babies were swept away in the storm, mothers had their children torn out of their arms. How can you say there's a God of love? And Franklin Graham said, well, there are a lot of things I don't understand. I would never profess to be able to explain all the ways of God. But I can tell you this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. After the death of the Son of God at Calvary, no one should ever again question the love of God. There are other people who say, well, I think probably God is a loving God, but obviously he's unable to help us in our dilemma. He's like some sort of kindly grandfather who is watching with dismay as his little children run out into the street and he's unable to help them. Well, you see that if, in the first case, we are saying that God is a monster who has the power but doesn't care, in the second place, we're saying that God isn't really God at all, is he? If he can't help me, well, then he really isn't God. There must be another option. And you know, the Bible tells us what the option is. The Bible doesn't avoid the issue. It hits it head on. It confronts the issue. In fact, the very first book ever written in our Bible is the book of Job. It doesn't come at the beginning of our Bible because the poetry books are put together a little later in the book. But the book of Job is the earliest book that was written, and it's a book all about human suffering. And so God's not trying to avoid the issue. 
What I'd like to do is read to you a verse from the ancient Hebrew prophet Isaiah. In chapter 61, there is a prophecy made concerning someone who would come into the world to help us on a rescue operation. And what would he come to do? Listen to these beautiful words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the meek. He has sent me to bind up or to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint to them that mourn in Zion, to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's what Jesus came to do. He knows how to heal broken hearts. I don't know your life. I don't know what you've been through, what you're struggling with. But I know someone who does know. And I'd like to speak just for a moment or two, not in any sort of philosophical way, but simply as friend to friend, about the role of suffering in the life of people. Why does God allow suffering? We learn from the Bible that God doesn't cause it, but he does allow it. Now, I happen to know that pretty much everyone in this room has paid someone in town good money to cause you pain. The dentist, maybe, or the chiropractor, or a surgeon, or a physical therapist. Because, you know, sometimes we think pain is good for us. Not pain in itself, but what pain can do for us. And I think, too, that many of the people who object to suffering in the world are not always the people who are suffering but the people who are observing other people suffering. Why does my granny, who's never heard a flea, have to be in all this pain? But the fact is that if you speak to people who are passing through suffering, sometimes they tell you it was the best experience of their life. One of the things that suffering does is it brings everything into focus. A businessman full of himself giving himself to making more and more money, forgets all about his family. Until one day, busy with his work, the phone rings, and he's told that his grandchild has been rushed to the emergency room of the hospital. What happens? Everything comes into focus, doesn't it? All of a sudden, suffering reminds us of what's important in life. There will be many people who will thank God they ever got cancer or ended up in prison or had a divorce or whatever the circumstance was in their life because it was that very thing that drove them to the Lord because they had nowhere else to go. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are tired of carrying your heavy loads. I'll give you rest. You don't have to go to him. He doesn't force himself on you. But you know, there's no one else who can heal broken hearts. No one else who can do what he can do. And I highly recommend him because in the hard times of our lives, we have found that Jesus knows just what to do. He's the friend of sinners, the Bible calls him. He's the comforter. He's the one who sticks closer than a brother. Suffering also makes us think about God. Sometimes in the busyness of life, we we get distracted and we hardly ever think about eternal issues. We hardly ever think about what's out there after this life. There was a cover photo on one of the news magazines. I think it was Newsweek. At the time when California was going through its shake and bake. You remember that? They had the earthquakes and fires. 
And there was a young Jewish fellow, I think his name was Geffen, on the cover, and they had a quote from him. He said, you don't like to think it, but you have to wonder if God's trying to get our attention. The Bible says that God, at the end of the age, is going to shake everything that can be shaken so that people will see the things that can't be shaken. And so as we look at... uh, Wall Street shaking, and we look at Washington shaking, we look at the international scene shaking, we look at marriages and families shaking, surely we want to find some solid ground, don't we? The Lord Jesus is called the rock on which we can build our lives, and even though we shake on him, he never shakes underneath. Suffering has a way of purifying us, has a way of burning off the dross. The Bible tells us that we came in naked, we're going to leave naked. That all of the things that we gather to ourselves someday, they'll be in somebody else's flea market. And all the things that we thought were so precious to us, we're going to leave them all behind, you know. And so says the Bible, prepare to meet your God. People prepare for all sorts of other things. They prepare for their children's education. They prepare for retirement, prepare for holidays, to get their teeth straightened, get their back fixed, all sorts of things we prepare for. But strange as it may seem, very few people prepare to meet God. The Lord has come on this great rescue operation. And he says that if a little suffering in this life has eternal benefits, then he thinks it's a bargain. Jesus told a story one day, it was a true story, I think, about a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man lived in a big mansion. And the poor man slept at his gate. And the only medical assistance he had was the dogs licking his sores. And he wished he could just eat some of the scraps that came from the rich man's house. And he died. Oh, and the rich man died too. You know, all your money can't stop death from inevitably coming. And both died, the poor man and the rich man. And the poor man, well, he went to Abraham's bosom. He went to the place of blessing. And the rich man, says Jesus, he went to hell. And when you first read the story, you might get the idea that the rich man went to hell because he'd already had his heaven, and the poor man went to heaven because he'd already had his hell. Because Abraham said, in your lifetime you had your good things, and he had his poor things, and now you're tormented and he's blessed. But that's really not what the story is telling us. And I know that because I read to the end of the story. And the man in hell tells us why he was there. He said, go warn my brothers and they'll repent and not come to this place. That's what he was saying. I never repented. What does it mean to repent? Well, it means you change your mind about things. It means you stop arguing when the Bible says you're a sinner. When you're the sinner that Jesus died to save, and you say, I I agree with God. I'm not going to excuse myself anymore. I'm going to agree with God. And when the Bible says that Christ died for our sins, and that he is the Savior of those who believe, I'm not going to say my good works are going to save me, or my church attendance, or my baptism. I'm going to believe what God says, and I'm going to believe that Christ is my Savior. And turning from my sins, I turn to God's Son, and I receive him as my Savior. You see, what Jesus was really telling us was this, that the man who was poor, his poverty exposed his need. Whereas the rich man, his riches disguised his need. 
And so in this land of affluence and plenty, we start to think we don't need anything. We don't need God. And that's a frightening thing. We need to discover that everything we have comes from God. And the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. God isn't good to us because we're good. God is good to us because he's good. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. We should never forget that. And so the Lord speaks to us in this land of plenty. He speaks to us in all of our good things. And we get so anesthetized to the voice of God by all of the blessings we have that sometimes he has to bring a little suffering into our lives to get our attention. He does it because he loves us. I tell you, if your children are playing on the street and you shout at them and say, get off the street, and I say to you, you shouldn't be so cruel to your children. Why do you shout at them like that? Well, a car was coming. If you go and your neighbor's house is burning down, you say, well, I wouldn't want to disturb them. They'd think I was rude if I knocked at the door now. (laughs) Why, you would raise your voice and you'd shout to them to get out. When the Lord Jesus talks about hell, it's love that warns us. It's because he loves us that he tells us this. He understands what suffering is like. He was poor. He was misjudged. He was taken advantage of. He was rejected by people. He was betrayed by his own friends. He was falsely accused and died for someone else's sins. But you know, he still loves the people who did it to him. It was our sins that took him there. And he still loves us. And he reaches out to us tonight. You're not here by accident. You're here because God had a message to share with you. And that message is a message of love. Yes, there is suffering in the world. And God's plan, according to scripture, is that someday he's going to make everything new. When people say, why doesn't God do something? Well, he is going to do something. But when he does something, he's going to do everything. And he's going to clean up the whole rotten mess. And so the question is, are you ready for final exams? Are you ready to meet God? As Franklin Graham said to Mr. Combs, who kept pressing him that day on the TV, He said, listen, those people that went out to lie on the beach and work on their tans that Sunday morning had no idea that before the day was out, they would be swept into eternity and stand before a holy God. But, he said to Mr. Combs, do you not realize that someday you too will get up in the morning and perhaps have no idea that that's the day you're going to stand before God? Are you ready to meet him? The Apostle Peter tells us why God has waited this long. He knows all the suffering in the world. Do you not think it grieves the heart of God, all the little neglected children, the abused women, the homeless street kids? Do you you not think it breaks his heart? He knows it all. Why? Does he wait another day? Peter writes these words. Don't think God is lazy. Don't think God is behind schedule. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. You see, some people think that the way to fix the problem is to rid the world of evildoers. Get all the bad people together and cut their heads off. The problem with that plan is that we're all bad guys and there'd be nobody left. So God says, I've got a better plan. What I'm going to do is show you your own sin, your own need, and show you that you need a Savior. 
And if you'll come to me as is, just the way you are, with your failed plans for your life and your broken dreams and your empty heart and your sin, if you'll come to me as is, just the way you are, I'll take you, I'll receive you. His promise is, no one comes to me that I ever turn away. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord Jesus wants to be your best friend. But the Bible tells us that our sin has separated between us and God. And what we need is a Savior to take away our sin and bring us into the family of God. And then to know in the hardest times of life that the Lord is there with us and for us all the way home to heaven. I'm so happy to be able to present a message of hope like this. In a world of bad news, it's great to hear some good news, isn't it? And this is the best news in all the world. Listen to these four sentences from the Word of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, some people say, the Bible's so confusing, I just can't make sense of it. In fact, one of the favorite arguments I hear is this. Well, of course, sir, everybody has their own interpretation. You know, you have yours and somebody else. Every church has a different interpretation. Well, it's true that the Bible has some passages that need to be interpreted, but the essential message of the Bible is perfectly clear. And it doesn't need to be interpreted. It just needs to be believed. So when the Bible says all have sinned, how would you interpret that? There's only one way to understand it, isn't there? You either believe it or you don't. All have sinned. Secondly, the soul that sins dies. That means that we're cut off from God by our sin. We can't get through. Like the telephone line, the phone is dead. We have equipment, God has equipment, but there's a cut in the line and we can't get through to God. We need the heavenly repairman to come and reconnect us to God, don't we? Listen to these beautiful words. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. All have sinned. The soul that sins dies. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, what do you have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Not easy. It's not easy because our will is involved. We don't like to say we're wrong and God's right. But that's what it takes in order to be saved, to know for sure that your sins are gone and you're right with God. I was just a young person when I discovered this. My parents, they taught me the Bible, but that couldn't help me. I had to make my personal choice to agree with God that I was the sinner and that Jesus died for me. And by simply receiving him, I discovered that he gave joy and peace in believing. I've never regretted it. It was the best choice I ever made. And I highly recommend him to you today. We're not talking about religion. People can have religion up to their nostrils. It doesn't do a thing. It just keeps you busy. It's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. What we need is a Savior. And when we put our trust in the Savior, he does what he said he would do. And in a moment of time, we know we've passed from death to life. And we're introduced to this wonderful friend who's with us all the way home. Listen to these simple words. In John chapter 1, 11 and 12, we read, He came to his own people, the Jewish people, and most of them wouldn't have him. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, even to those that believed on his name. So to believe on him is more than just believing facts about him. The Bible says the demons, they believe too, and it doesn't do them any good. You may have grown up where you heard all this information and you believed it, but you've never personally received the Lord Jesus. Today's the day, says God. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you very much for listening.